So we'll go ahead and open this meeting of the Northampton Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, this, uh, we have one item on the agenda, which is a continuation of the matter that we uh, began to hear at our May 27th meeting. Um, the members of the board in this meeting and voting today are myself, David Bloomberg, Sarah Northrup, and Elizabeth Silver. Carolyn Mish is back with us, providing staff support from the City of Northampton Office of Planning and Sustainability. Um, since this is a continuation of the hearing on the matter that was commenced on May 27th, I think we can probably just proceed with any additional comments that the applicant or his representative would like to make to the board any information that the applicant may want to bring to the board's attention that was not discussed at the last meeting. Uh, then the board members will have an opportunity to ask questions of the applicant and his representative or his representative. And um, after that, members of the public who are attending will have an opportunity to comment uh, or ask questions about this matter. Um, I do, um, I will ask everyone who speaks to uh, just identify yourself by name and address for the record that's being kept. And that questions or comments be addressed to the board members as opposed to directed to the applicant. Um, and um, to the extent that a comment um, that you might wanna make has essentially already been made by someone else. Uh, you're welcome to address the board, but we would ask that you just endorse or object to a, the comment that's already been made so that we avoid the repetition of, uh, of the same comments or observations over and over again to the extent reasonably possible. Um, all right, I'm just going to... Uh, mention one more time that notice of this hearing for May 27th was originally published on May 13th and May 20th. And the matter that we're hearing is a continuation uh, of the appeal of the building commissioner's decision by Pat Melnick Sr., trustee of Beaverbrook Nominee Trust and Raul and Farah Mata that a lot is not a building lot at the end of Grove Avenue in Leeds. Parcel ID is map five parcel 12. Uh, so uh, do we have, um, I can't see all of the faces, but uh, do we have either the applicant or his representative on the, in the meeting and ready to address the board to pick up where we left off two weeks ago? Uh, yes, Attorney Solowski representing um, Pat Melnick as the, uh, the trustee, as well as the Mata family as the, um, the applicants uh, in addition. And I believe they're okay. also in, in the meeting. I, I see uh, Mr. Mata and uh, I see a little icon for Pat Melnick. Okay. Um, and I guess to get started just on the continuation of the hearing, um, um, is there anything additional you want to bring to the attention to the board to add to uh, what was discussed two weeks ago? Well, so I think two weeks ago, generally the question is, uh, some people wanted to see some different plans and things like that. And, and I did upload some, I don't know if you've had a chance to look, I think maybe one of the best ones for understanding where everything is and how it's situated is, uh, mm -hmm. is labeled as plan book 200 page 27. And it would actually end up being on um, a further page, not 27, but if you scroll down, it would be page 20, um, 28 and nine, where you can see the property depicted um, more clearly than some of those other plans. As uh, along Grove Ave, um, the property is depicted in the, um, on page 20, is it 20? This is on page 28 of that plan book in the lower right-hand corner. You can see Grove Ave and it's 5-12. Um, John F. Hanley trustee is how the parcel's labeled. You can see that um, 
Grove Ave. And, you know, I think there was some question from some of the individuals as to how, how this was actually situated, looking at this old plan um, of Washington Heights compared to the new. And that I think helps uh, along with um, some of the other things that I had uh, uploaded where you can see there's some, um, there's a deed study that shows some of the parcels there and, and just kind of shows where those parcels, the um, one, two, and three on the Washington Heights plan are the current um, 12 um, parcel um, 5-12 now. And I think some people were having a little bit of trouble figuring that all out and um, conceptually because those three tiny lots were are all um, merged into one bigger lot in this instance. Um, as and far what, as excuse me, what excuse me, what was the plan book number again, please? So the one of the better plans to look at is, is plan book two hundred page twenty seven, but it's actually it's so it, that's a four page um, plan. So it's actually not twenty seven. Isn't the good one to? It doesn't actually show you what you want to see. It's actually two hundred and page twenty eight, and if you look at the lower right hand corner of that, that's you know sheet number two of four. And um, I think if you go, so it's got, go a little bit lower on that. And just a little bit below your cursor, just a little bit to the right of your cursor, um, John F. Hanley. And that's where you can see this 5-12 um, for the parcel right there in Grove Ave um, depicted on that um, recorded plan. Um, and, and so I think some of the board members and some other individuals had questions about that. I think that kind of maybe helps them um, conceptually anyways, uh, determine where that property is located and how it's set up. Thanks, I think that was my question. Yeah. Um, so on I, this plan, the, the paper street that, if, if I remember your, in your concluding remarks two weeks ago, you said the real, thrust of your uh, assertion is that that the locus that is the subject of this appeal has frontage on a paper street and therefore that satisfies the requirement for frontage for purposes of being able to build on the on the lot so so where is the paper street in, in our imagination on, on this uh, plan book 200, page 28 that we're looking at? On 228, it's, it shows Grove Ave, Grove Avenue. So um, it's just that length of Grove Avenue. Yeah, right where it says Grove Avenue. <clears throat> right. And so that, and so 28, and then if you go on to the next, um, to 29, it shows it also there, Grove Avenue, it shows it on um on the left side of 29 you can see on that yeah just to the left of your cursor where it says grove avenue a little bit further to the left so those you know those match up up um so it's a little bit hard to conceptualize there's four pages of this huntley plan but there's actually eight continuations so if you were to take this huntley plan and chop it up with a pair of scissors and tape it up together those match lines you'd have one giant long plan so it's a little bit confusing but that's where that grove ave on on this um 29 matches up with 28 and did you say that our locus is lot 5-12 yeah 512 which is most clearly shown on um 228 in the lower right corner I, it may not even actually be depicted entire at all uh, just the very edge of it is depicted on um, on 29, it's not even labeled. It just you can see where the end of it would be. Um, Bernard Przinsky, Przinsky. So to the left of that would be the sure. Lucas. Yeah, that's the mo most clear. So there's that. Um, another thing I wanted to bring to everybody's attention is the judgment um, from um, Civil right. Docket HSCV 2004-00029. Um, so it's been um, a, a, a superior court judge has, has ruled and ordered in 2011 that Grove Ave goes legally at least all the way until this property. 
So um, I think it had been stated before that there was a 37 foot or 30 something foot gap between where the road legally went and this property. That's just simply not the case. Um, this, you know, it, it has been um, adjudicated that the Grove Ave does go all the way to this property. In addition to that, um, I do, you know, in our alternative argument as to why this property is entitled before to, um, to the, wait, uh, sorry, yep, go ahead. For interrupting, but before you move on to an alternative argument, what I'm looking at in that judgment on the, on the finding of the court yep. says that um, judgment shall enter declaring that Grove Ave is a public way for its entire length to the point where it abuts the property now owned by Beaver Brook nominee trust. Um, and can you back on one of these maps also point out where that is? Is it not the terminus of Grove Ave? So Beaverbrook nominee trust would then own the, um, and, and maybe one of the better maps. So let me see which map would be And also I just want to remind you all that it, the right of way versus the improved right of way are two different things and that's 37 foot gap. So it's not that the board heard that it didn't go to the edge of the property, it was that, that it was unimproved um, for the last extent. So that's um, a big part of the equation is the whether or not the street's been improved. Okay. Yeah, and I think our argument would be that that's not um, that's not a requirement of the uh, the uh, regulations. It's it's public way. Um, you need to have frontage on a public way. The judge has ruled that this public way all the way up until this property along the front of this property is at 50 feet, um, more than sufficient for the current uh, zoning of that frontage. And I know it had been said by various uh, members of the board uh, that certain other properties in Northampton have been denied um, permits because the um, their frontage is on the end of a, a street. I, I and I think Carolyn has confirmed that that that's not a regulation that is found in these uh, these zoning regulations. That I mean that's just not a rule. Whether or not somebody has done that before, um, it's not a rule. And because somebody is denied somebody improperly before whether or not those were on pri prior zoning regulations or not it's not a rule under these current zoning regulations and to de deny uh, that would essentially be the board or or the, the building um uh person in charge of the issuing the permit really essentially just making up a rule and and reading it into regulations that are not there it's not there i was unable to find it and and i think carolyn confirmed with me that it's um in, in her um in her letter, it's not included in the regulations that are- Can I, can I interject something? Uh, hang on, hang on, please. I, I still have a question that's pending yeah. here, um, which is the point where it abuts the property now owned by Beaverbrook Nominee Trust. Where uh, is that? So that is on, um, what have we got for the- What is that what's point? The, east? the point is the end of the bookbinder property at, at that point coming along to the current- <clears throat> um, if anybody wants to pull up, I mean, uh, there's various maps here I could show along. So uh, that right one there, there, so that point right there showing that and was this is kind the of the 30, Yeah, this is the 37 feet of unimproved. And and um, just to clarify, the zoning says that frontage is taken along the right of way, not at the end. So um, that's the interpretation that the city has taken that it's always been along the right of way. So. That would be this line and this line. And in the photographs that we've had showing the terminus of Grove Ave, um, where those two orange cans are or whatever, is that the same place? Yeah, essentially. Right. Yeah, okay. Okay. The, the cones are at the end of the um, improved way. So then 37 feet beyond that, there's a bollard that's a permanent bollard, not like the orange can, um, cones. Right. And that's the edge of the um, private property. Uh, uh, no, that bollard is actually a, a good distance into the, um, into the property owned by the, the trust. 
that Bollard would not need to be moved to, um, in any way in order to grant access. There's considerable distance where the driveway could be before that Bollard um, and still grant access to this property. I, th I think he's right about that. Having looked at it half an hour ago. Yeah, I looked right. at it. I'm just saying the bollard so. is at the edge of the, 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 it indicates the mark, I mean, on our survey plans that where the road bike path was constructed, that bollard is uh, approximately at the location uh, where the pro private property starts um, from the end of the right of way based on our survey for the bike path construction. So um, we have a lot of different images here, a lot of different plans. The one I'm looking at right now um, on the uh, permitting uh, archive website, northamptonnow.gov, um, is called Exhibit D, Plan of Beaver Brook. And I uh, zoom in on this property map and I see Grove Ave and I see the um, beginning of the lot in question being contiguous with the end of the bookbinder property. Uh, and on can, that survey, I'm seeing on the bookbinder property, there's can you, can you share this one? Because I, I can't find it as quickly as you just did. I will try. I I can, do you want me to put it up, Sarah? If you'd like, and, um, and then blow it up. Okay. Uh, scrolling a little to, I want to see a little more to the right. Um, yeah, it's losing. Okay, that's. I can see that. Okay, so what I saw there. Um, give it one more. Thank you. The bookbinder property. The survey shows the front corners of the house and a garage. The that garage, which isn't in great condition, but it is lined up almost exactly with those orange barrels. The. Um, that the yellow bollards that are installed in the bike path pavement are, that's maybe 37 feet. I don't know exactly with the scale, but it is a, it's a walk beyond there. Right at the end, basically where their garage is, that small rectangle, um, there are two um, city drainage basins and the right now four orange barrels. So the pavement is, is going along uh, full width to where those basically in front of that garage and then it narrows because down quickly. Yeah, I think this is the line actually right here. No, I'm showing um, the you see that little tiny rectangle? Yeah. That's that's okay. the garage. And the edge of that garage is lined up with the orange barrels. It's just a, you know, a a point from this from uh, from which we can start this discussion. Yeah. That's what I'm looking for clarity on that right. point. I'm just going to stop that for a second. Thanks. So, Sarah, is there a question you're asking the appellant here? I'm, I'm trying to clarify. Uh, appellant is saying one thing, Carolyn is saying something, Elizabeth was oh. answering or asking, oh. and, and I was just there specifically with the survey in hand um, uh, and I, looking at the garage and my tape measure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just, mm -hmm. here's a picture of it. So you can see the edge of the garage here. There you go. Yep. This is, I zoomed in on this so this text doesn't make sense here, but the edge of the right of way is here. You can see the catch basin just outside of that expanded width. Um, so there's a little bit of distance between the edge of the road width and the barrels, unless those have 
um, been pushed back since this mm. photo was taken. Maybe that's it. Maybe they were moved slightly. <laughs> Though I would call a catch basin an improvement. Um, I think that's kind of minor point in our larger decision process. Right. So the edge is just behind the catch basin there. Yeah, right here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Isn't the larger issue that if we were to accept the appellant's primary argument, I'll call it, that because they have frontage on a paper street that was laid out on a plan many, many decades ago, they have the right to count that as frontage for purposes of being able to build on this lot. And if we were to accept that argument, there are countless recorded plans all over town in the land records of, of properties all over town in the land records with paper streets laid out that were never developed. If you follow the large logic of that argument, just if, if, if only from a common sense standpoint, although I realize we're also obligated to apply the law here and I'll, we'll get to that. Um, there could be people all over the city of Northampton who happen to have pieces of property with frontage on ancient paper streets that have never been built or developed who could take the same position and demand from the building inspector a building permit. And, and, the, and I'll give the appellant a chance to respond, but the converse is we have a system. First of all, we have definitions in the ordinance for frontage, all of which generally include a requirement that the frontage to be counted as frontage to determine the buildability of a lot. And Carolyn, correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, they have to have been improved in a certain way if not approved by the planning board as part of either a planning board decision or an approval not required plan. But I'm, I'm having a real problem with, it. not that our decisions are precedent setting per se, but with, the, with what we're being asked to do. And that is uh, to say that uh, just talking about the primary argument that's being made, that anyone with frontage on a non-existent paper street, I'll say, um, has the absolute right to build on that piece of land, notwithstanding the failure to have any improvements to that way, that paper way, um, that would enable public safety considerations to be satisfied and everything else that the planning board evaluates every other week when they hear applications for subdivision approvals. And I'll, I'll add a couple thoughts. Um, back when the, the large, as I understand it, when the larger project was approved, um, it was a requirement this was April 9th, 2008, to have various traffic and other mitigation features to ensure pedestrian safety and so on. And those features actually, if I'm reading this correctly, included the use of, or the de dedication or an easement for this bike path as a bike path, unless if I'm crisscrossing facts here, Carolyn, please correct me. Um, the, it, it, but to go to the larger point, you know, there are other decisions that we've been looking at since two weeks ago, court decisions, also the Mass Appellate Court, several of them more recent than the one case, LeBlanc, that was cited by the appellant. And those decisions are various contexts, but the gist of each decision is this question of what satisfies the requirement for frontage. Um, and dicta in one of them, which is Shea versus Board of Appeals 35 Mass App 519, says 
not only for the good of the homeowner, but also for the safety of the public, a town can insist that homes not be built on lots lacking adequate access for fire trucks and emergency vehicles. Even if an avenue is accepted um, as a way shown on a plan, in this case, previously approved by the planning board, a fire truck cannot drive on a plan. I think that's a pretty powerful statement. Um, a zoning bylaw which requires frontage on a way shown on an approved plan must be understood if the purpose of the bylaw is not to be undermined, to require an actual way constructed on the ground, not just a depiction of a way on a plan. Um, and in another decision, which, which I, the reason I'm citing these is because they support what to me is a, is a completely common sense response to what we're being asked to do here, um, which is overturn the decision of the building inspector on the grounds that the existence of a paper street that was never developed, at least in front of the, the locust, allows, gives an absolute right to the property owner to build on that lot that fronts on the paper street. And in the case of Perry versus Planning Board of Nantucket, 15 Mass App 144, um, they say, we conclude that whatever status might be acquired by ways for purposes by virtue of their having been quote, laid out unquote, such ways will not satisfy the requirements of a public way unless they in fact exist on the ground in a form which satisfies the goals in this case of the uh, approval not required statute 81M. But, but um, so I'm, I'm sort of going on and on here, but it's because I would like to hear Attorney Sislawski's response to these concerns. Um, if, if, if we accept your argument, I, I guess I don't want to say it a third time, that just because a, a, a way is laid out on, but I will, uh, a way is laid out on a plan 70 years ago or whenever, the, home, the, the property owner has a right to build because that satisfies the frontage. We've circumvented the entire planning board process, which was used for most of the Beaver Brook pr development projects. Um, in this case, what you're asking also seems to be contrary of one of the, to one of the conditions of that approval, namely the bike, the use of the bike path. But um, we seem to be circumventing the role of the planning board here to ensure that standards of public safety in the design and construction of the way are satisfied. And I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I mean, so it, it, it's certainly our argument that we do have sufficient access to this property. I think, you know, we, we established that, you know, you can drive there um, as, you know, I, I know some people contend that, that it's not sufficient or it's a skinny road. A house was just built a few years ago, directly abutting this. If they had sufficient access, we've got exactly the same access they had. Um, if, if the board was able to say, geez, you, you know, even though you have frontage, on Grove Ave, um, and, and I did include that um, building permit in this, and I think it's um, 71 is the, I, I don't know if that's the address or the lot number. Um, I think that might just be the, the, it looks like parcel 10 it was. So I think property location 83 Grove Ave. So they've got exactly the same access that we've got. They're directly abutting this. If, if the board's saying, well, if we're not going to grant this because there's no access, even if it is, if, even if it's got um, frontage, we're saying there's no access. Well, the board, you know, this directly abutting property got a building permit and built a brand new house there a few years ago with the exact same access this does. It has, it's abutting. If a fire truck, you know, if the concern is a fire truck can't get here or there, it's, it's exactly the same. You know, Northampton's currently, you know, got, um, New zoning allowing multiple parts, multiple um, buildings on one parcel. You know, not every building in the back has got its own access. You know, fire trucks have hoses. Um, you know, if that's the only concern, Northampton is 
balancing these concerns. And I think by reading the the um, the zoning regulations, it, it 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 takes into that account. You don't need to drive a fire truck to the house. You don't need to drive it into the garage. Um, you know, you, you can't do that in, in most of downtown Northampton. There's a lot houses that are behind houses that are all in tight little areas. That's the way life is. And, and realistically, um, it's unaffordable to have houses on with so much access that you could drive a fire truck into the house. Um, but th they, but, but I thought the, we were, excuse me, I thought we were talking about the argument regarding the required frontage versus yeah, no, so I, I mean alone. And, and I think we have the frontage and, and, and that's it. And, you know, and then the board is, is made point and made a point that even if there is the frontage, they don't feel that the access is adequate. And we feel the access is more than adequate. Also, so there's frontage and there's access, you know, if you've got a, um, a property out in the middle of a swamp and in somewhere in other elsewhere in town, that's on a paper street that may have been laid out, they don't have that access that we have. So that, you know, to differentiate to the board that, you know, it's not going to be just no holds barred any plan that was ever recorded, you know, people are just going to go and build on I think this property is different than those, it's paved right to the property. Um, you know, the, well, the, I, I um, personally didn't think we were talking about access. Other people may have commented. On I that. think other people. I thought we were talking about that. required frontage and what is the definition of frontage under yeah. the ordinance. And that requires improve, you know, a certain level of improvement, not just minimally sufficient access so you can get a car to the garage on, on the property. But, um, and I don't know, Carolyn, if you wanted to comment at all on this comparison to the other property, but, but I'm not sure access, I mean, the, what you need is frontage. It was denied because you didn't have frontage, yeah. not because you didn't have access. Well, I, I think uh, I some think people with the board have maybe, or, or possibly uh, it was just people commenting on it and that they- Or they blurring a line there or raising a separate issue. But I think the legal issue is has to do with the sufficiency of frontage. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, we've got that in, in, in multiple, in two ways, at least. Um, again, across the front line of, uh, of the street if we don't have it, um, if the board thinks that it doesn't exist along the paper street, I think it does exist the other way. And even though the board has said other properties have been denied, that that the um, the board has not counted that that 50 feet across the front for other properties. That's not a regulation that's in, actually included in Northampton zoning regulations, and that should not yeah. and does not control. But I think I think what Carolyn said. It's always been the interpretation when it says frontage along a way that that does not mean at the end of the way but but your point is taken that uh, and i don't uh, think it says a lot along a way either um i don't think those are the words that it uses i think um i think it was emory this is crowley was um the one that talked about the the terminus not counting as frontage am i am i correct in that one I think there was a discussion about that, about otherwise you'd have overlapping interests with the properties right. along the that's way. Right. So that's, that's where the term right. along because, the way for gaining because, frontage. Yeah, because, right. Right. And, and I mean, I think those are different issues. That's you know, who owns the fee in the, in the middle of the street. And, and I think that's really just a different issue than this. And I don't think it can be compared. And, and I did see on some of the letters submitted, they do cite that, but it's an entirely different issue. Who owns the fee underneath that? piece of asphalt well not um, if you're trying to count that that line there as part of the frontage it's not a different issue but i think the the legal issue in in crowley that they're talking about is who owns the the fee underneath that asphalt um which is really not relevant to the point of the zba who the zb you know the, the zoning board and the they don't care who owns the the dirt under the asphalt for fire truck. Right, but I think service. the idea was that that, because, that the butt end of a street, uh, the concepts are related, that, that if that the, the abutter at the end of the street, because the fee is owned by the two abutters on each side of the street, the abutter at the end of the street has no fee interest in the end of the street. And so it's a small jump from there to say that that, so that's not frontage, but um, but that's just one 
concept. I, I think the broader idea is that these various cases uh, seem to support the position of the building inspector. Um, you've got to have some way to enforce public safety. And one way that is done is by ensuring quote unquote, adequate quote unquote frontage, which my understanding is in our zoning ordinance, the various definitions or options always include improved. Let me ask you, ask you this. Um, since we're not just talking about access, if we were just talking about access, yeah, you know, people can put a, any kind of driveway they want on their personal, on their own property, but um, within reason. I mean, the, but uh, um, I guess there is some regulation of that. But um, but if we're talking about frontage, we're talking about the need for an improved way, and not just any improvements, but a way that's been improved in such a manner that public safety is assured by you know fire fire police etc um if we were to overturn the decision of the building inspector doesn't that mean the city now has no mechanism to address in the specifications for this the development of this way uh, to in, ensure such that public safety is protected? Well, I mean, the, the city can, I mean, as opposed to what the, the house can be built any way they want. I mean, they have to build the house according to the regulations and they have to put their driveway in according to the regulations and it's gotta be well, maybe built it's according a question to the regulations. Carolyn. Maybe this is a question for Carolyn. When somebody gets a building permit to build a house with a private driveway on it, Carolyn, I assume the fire department does not comment unless what the building inspector raises a question himself? Well, for a private driveway, there are only regulations about grade um, as it in the zoning ordinance. Um, and it could be that that triggers a building code requirement for fire suppression or something else. But, um, there's always, I mean, driveways are granted access to the public way um, and from the public way. And then it's built according to whatever the private property, or however the private property owner wants to build it. Um, but it's certainly the city's position that the, the um, public way, the, the improve, there's no improved public way to the very end of the uh, right of way. And so all of that would have to be improved to subdivision standards to then be able to grant um, access um, because the emergency vehicles are on the public way. They never go up driveways. Fire truck and the uh, um, you know, ambulances might go up driveways, but fire trucks go um, have access from the public way. And so the right. importance of emergency access is to be able to go to the extent of the public way to the private, um, where the right. private driveway. Well, my, and, uh, yeah, and we're not talking about a, a, a private driveway here. I was just saying by analogy, if we overturn the building inspector's decision, the property owner can do almost whatever they want, at least with respect to access on a driveway, except for grade grading issues, I guess. And, um, and that again, wouldn't that circumvent the uh, the role of the planning board? Because as we said in the last hearing, there is an alternative option here, and that is to go to the planning board. Correct, Carolyn? Correct. So that the planning board has an opportunity to uh, address these issues. Right. Um, and I think you know to I. Think I think what you're suggesting too is, although I'd have to say that given that there's public way, um, unimproved public way, um, that gap, that 37 foot gap, um, I don't believe the applicant would actually be allowed to um, use the bike path as the driveway to get to extend to the private property. And then they'd, be required by DPW to build in accordance with city standards on that 37 foot 
you know, gap between the end of that to um, the private property and make it sufficient so that it was met the standards for emergency access and drainage um, and all of that. May I? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so um, my understanding is that when uh, someone's building a house and they're putting in a driveway, there's a limit to the width of that driveway. I think it's 15 feet. It's pretty narrow. Um, and what I saw out there today was um, the end of the improved area, as Carolyn describes. And then we have a uh, bike path constructed, which um, was uh, specifically um, funded in the agreement with Beaver Brook Nominee Trust when they were doing their development. So a, a, wherever the pot of money was, in any case, there was you know whatever it was, $50,000 or something, put towards the bike path. What I saw when I walked past the orange barrels was a widened area of the asphalt looking a lot like a driveway apron immediately over the property line. Um, I don't know how long it's been there, which plan it was shown on. It's not identical to what's shown on uh, that exhibit D plan. Um, it's, there's the, uh, there's the couple pieces that are, um, that are bugging me and then I'll get to what I think is more of a gist of it. One is, um, I don't, I don't uh, see a problem with somebody being able to build a house back there. Um, I think it's a nice spot and there's arguments about whether or not that's um, you know, increasing the uh, traffic, et cetera, incrementally. We all know when you measure the increment, it's very small. What I'm um, more concerned about and, and the discussion of what's uh, improved or not doesn't quite matter to me as much because I would expect if somebody's having to pave a driveway, they're gonna do, they're gonna have to do that piece of it also, um, just as they already paid to do a piece of it. Um, my confusion is about uh, when there's more than one case made for overturning the building dis inspector's decision. Um, well, maybe we overturn on this basis, uh, they'd like it to overturn us on that basis. Um, I've seen these multiple plans. Um, some say, okay, this is a paper street. Well, um, how much of it is a paper street? Does the applicant own it or not? Is it the is it the hundred feet or is it the fifty feet? Is it uh, if it's the length along what was the paper street? that continues to the, um, this has pretty, uh, uh, pretty clear effect on the next lot, the Bernard Przinsky lot and the Joseph Boisford lot. It, it, yeah, it, it has effect on the other lots down there. So um, is the, was the build, so here's the gist of it. Exactly what was it that the building inspector denied? Was it based on, uh, was the applicant putting forward that they have 115 feet of frontage along a paper street or that they have approximately 50 feet frontage at the end of Grove Ave? Wh which one is it? Which, which was the building inspector ruling on? That's what I'd like to know. What, what did the exactly was the applicant asking for? Not the multiple possible arguments now, but what was the building inspector ruling on that we were being asked to overturn? Maybe attorney. Car Carolyn, do you have do you have that information? Do you know what I mean? Did I ask that yeah. clearly? No, I understand. Yeah. Um, I'll just pull up, I think the original zoning permit application is on the file. So it, let me just, I mean, unless the oh, yeah. appellant wants to raise, bring up a, their document okay. that they submitted, that would be fine too. I, I think um, I'm looking at the same thing. Meantime. 
This is the mm -hmm. one called permit application, Patrick Melnick Sr. So I think it says existing and proposed frontage is 50 feet on that application. I don't know if that's. Yeah, I saw that. It does say that. Ah, okay. Thank you for clearing that up because I thought there was there was a, a discussion of that previous paper. There's all this talk about Paper Street. Um, to me, seem to be addressing what is now occupied by the bike path, lengthwise. So, to me, the the paper street uh, is is almost moot. What we have is fifty feet proposed, fifty feet of frontage at the end of Grove Avenue. Am I? I'm trying to simplify this and clarify. Yeah, no, I understand. Zoning it. board's jurisdiction over exactly what is it that the building inspector which and if and if on. that is, and if that's the case arguably the only issue in front of us is i do like that this issue really about uh, you know at the end at the uh, you know can you use the end of a road aside from the 37 foot gap question which they which, could pave later pay for whatever utilities i'm not concerned about that yeah, well, I, think I think realistically, as you know, utilities get put in there, that's going to get ripped up and repaved anyways. As you know, if somebody builds along the side of a road, it's not paved to the edge of the property. There's a, you know, a buffer along the side of the road, and that's going to get ripped up, and utilities are going to get put in while it's um, while the driveway is put in. So I, I think that 37 feet is really almost a non-issue. But I'm what I'm looking at also is when this lot, when the Beaver Brook development happened and there was uh, all this conservation land and uh, money towards bike path improvements, et cetera. Uh, when all of that was being negotiated, negotiated, um, the predecessor of the applicant, whatever, that, that this lot that we're talking about was very carefully drawn and surveyed there it is appendix d plan of beaver brook with this this lot very specifically not giving the paper street to the city for the bike path holding it maybe in order to have more square footage for future development and then yes there was that term which i read in that um in those documents i can't remember exactly where it was saying that they were reserving some right there now, I don't know if that uh, was just because I say I, I reserve a right doesn't mean I get it or had it to begin with, but uh, there was some intention and agreement in that process. And here it is years later. Um, that's why it's so important for me on the zoning board to really simplify exactly what is it when I um, when I say yes or no, the building inspector being correct or not, I want to know exactly what I'm saying he's correct or not about, because I don't want to make blanket statements about all of these other issues. It's too muddy. Yeah, that's a good, good point. I think I've just add so that I think the last hearing and my um, staff memo to you all at that time was all about taking frontage at the end of the street. And then at the last hearing, you heard about the length of the paper street and the argument was that they had frontage off of the paper street. So just sort of going back to two weeks ago, um, there's still the issue that even if you, um, it takes a unanimous vote to overturn the building commissioner, if you were to do that, um, there's still the question uh, in the definition of frontage, if you determine that since the zoning is not clear enough to say that it's not along, but it's at the, it could be at the end, there's still the, in the definitions about um, the improved portion that, um, of that way. And so it would have to be improved according to, you know, the planning board makes that determination as opposed to the zoning board about whether it's improved to a standard to uh, a constructed way standard to access uh, from which to access a private property. Is there any mechanism for the planning board to make that determination outside a subdivision consideration? Good question. Um, 
Yes, they could. They could determine that the subdivision is not required, that they can, mm -hmm. that adequate, adequate um, uh, provision is made for emergency vehicles and access. Would that be in the context of an app of an application to amend the prior uh, approvals that uh, related to the larger development? Um, it could be sort of both. It could be an amendment of that original special permit because that permit showed a bike path there. So it depends on how the applicant was showing emergency um, and adequate access from the public way. Um, or it could just be an application to the planning board for a new permit um, or a, de a determination or request for the board to make a determination whether adequacy, uh, adequacy of the way is met. On, um, and if it's not, then seeking the um, proper permit path to ensure that that is met can be mm -hmm. determined by the planning board. I mean, those are all things that the zoning board doesn't do, right? It's a, all, all, right. pretty much all of the above. Mm. So, I mean, I think a little bit, I think things are getting a little bit muddled on this part as far as what, you know, what's improved and what's not. The frontage requirement in the, in the Northampton zoning Previously, the, the previous zoning regiment did prohibit the end of a street from being used. That was changed. It's no longer prohibited. It's not in this regulation, even though people cite cases that where it was, was, was those, that was under the prior zoning regiment. The current regiment now uses ORs. There's OR, OR, OR. It is a public way or a way which the city clerk certifies is maintained and used as a public way this way has been ruled by a judge to be a public way or the other ways. We've got that number one without a question. That's it's actually a not number one. It is a public way has been ruled to be a public way. We've got 50 feet of frontage on a, an adjudicated public way, whether or not it's improved, whether or not it's anything, it is an adjudicated public way. We've got 50 feet and, um, and the, these zoning regulations do not prohibit it or do not require it don't address the fact whether or not it's at the end of a street a prior regulations did address that this specifically was removed from the current regulations making it clear that that's no longer the case um, these regulations don't prohibit that this is a public way it has been adjudicated to be a public way up to this property this property abuts a public way frontage a first three words a public way we we abut it and the public way you're talking about now is the end of Grove Avenue. The end that... of Grove Ave, which has been adjudicated and the, uh, the judgment is in the, in the record. Um, that's the uh, docket ending in 29. So isn't, and you're saying there was a change in the Northampton zoning ordinance so that it should no longer, so uh, uh, decision and, and, should no, no longer be based on the position that it's not frontage because it's at the end of at the end of a public way so prior and, and i don't have i wasn't able to get the actual text of the prior regulations but it's been reported to me by um by senior individuals who have done this that the prior zoning regulations in, in enacted at the time of some of these other decisions did prohibit the end of a way from being used those you regulations know which section you don't have a citation to the ordinance so that we can check on that? I, I don't have the old records. No, I don't. But what's the, the new, the, what's the citation in the, in the new? The ordinance? new, it's not included. There's nothing that prohibits. Oh, what's the citation that I'm citing is frontage under uh, 352-1 general under the definitions, frontage. A public way. You, this, it is a public way. It's unquestionable. It's been adjudicated to be a public way up to this point. Carolyn, do you have any comment on that? Um, I don't, without knowing what year um, the references for where it may have used to say, you can't take it from the end of the street. 
Um, I don't know. If, I don't. I don't have a comment. I, I mean, I, I don't can know look. If... I can look at the last. You know, I can do quick checks over the last. You know, few decades to see if I can figure that out. I don't. Um, I would have to. If that change were made, I would have to also see if it were deliberately removed or if it were, um, you know, if it just happened to be cut off on the codification. I'm so sorry, I, I, what was I don't the, know. What was the 350 what? Uh, it looks like it's 350-2.1 general. It's... Um, <laughs> That's what was in your staff memo. So it's just in the table format of your staff memo. Yeah, it's just the definition from of the definition. And just to point, those are ors between each of those, or, or, or. It doesn't have to be all those things. But the, the really, the just, I mean, this is an, an turning in a different direction here, but this is, so the argument you're now making is because you have frontage, 50 feet of frontage, at the end of the part of Grove Avenue that's definitely a public way, that satisfies the frontage requirement. And that's uh, hinged on the difference, I hear a difference of opinion about the public way. Um, Carolyn suggesting that the public way ends where the maintained improved pavement ends. Right, I'm um, still confused on this point too, the 37. It's confusing feet. because it keeps, the pavement does continue because the applicant paid the city to pave more with the bike path and there's a wide area. But that wide area only comes after it narrows. So yep, it narrows it, and then that, it out this, again. There's this so why open. Why did they do that? Right. So it's not continuous wide up until that little wide berth you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Right before that, it's very narrow and not improved. True. And it, but is it not common for a developer to improve their building, whether they're driving, uh, putting in aprons? driveway aprons or uh, in within the public way, um, adding utilities, cutting into the pavement, repaving curbs. They're often required, various developers are often required to put in sidewalks and curbs and, and trees and any number of improvements. Um, so the fact that it's not improved doesn't say it couldn't be improved. I don't, I'm, it's still too messy for me. I, I want to know right. exactly so, so, what yeah. it was that the building inspector said no to. And it, my understanding is specifically, quote, not enough frontage. You know, I, I think that. The, go ahead, go ahead, Carolyn. I was just going to say, I thought that that was answered by the applicant saying they were addressing, they were saying 50 feet along the T end of. Grove, and that's what the answer no was, because there was no frontage taken at the end of the street, um, and that it wasn't improved frontage from that that point. And yes, absolutely, builders um, put in those improvements, and those are determined by the planning board as meeting the safe standard. So I think the question isn't that they couldn't do it. I think mm -hmm. the question is the path to get there for that approval. Good point. And I, and I think what, um, I, I wanted to push back a little bit, Sarah, to mm -hmm. your interest in totally narrowing the issue to the very specifics, um, uh, you know, of exactly what got denied for what reason, because mm -hmm. I, we could, this could go on interminably. You know, and I, I do think it behooves us to look at the whole picture besides, I mean, because it affects this entire application. It's, mm -hmm. it may just be, and, and you know, attorney Zaslavsky has 
provided us with many alternative arguments. So I, I think that it behooves us to look at the big picture um, and not any one little piece because you can lose, you can force this into a very long protracted, um, you know, contentious set of hearings. Mm, um, and you can also lose the big picture when you're only focusing on a little piece. And it seems to me like, you know, there, there, are, um, there are procedures that we, and legal pieces that we should be looking at, even if they weren't specifically carved out. I think in the, you know, this is informal enough of a hearing that we can consider the different aspects of the arguments that have been presented to us um, and include those in our thought process. I, I think narrowly confining it would probably do a disservice to everybody here. Okay. A little bit yeah. of a pushback there. Uh, yeah, absolutely valid. I'm, on one hand, and it's a balancing thing, you know, on the other hand, our, we do have some discretion and it would be really nice. This is the kind of thing, the fact that it comes up periodically means that this is something that's kind of a, an annoying problem that the building inspector bumps up against regularly. Okay. Um, did, did we want to maybe hear from uh, people who might be waiting to comment on this? I think we... Sure. Um, if, but can I suggest though that if these are people who have submitted a letter, um, I, I believe I can speak for the three of us to say that we've read all of the letters that have been submitted. Um, and so we would appreciate not having them read back to us yet again. And that if there is something in addition to the letter or perhaps a 15 second summary, um, that would be appropriate. I don't mean to cut off comment, but we are prepared and we have read your comments. Um, okay. Um... And I'm also aware that uh, um, that Carolyn might have another commitment at 7 p.m. Um, and we're not yeah. going to continue once she needs to leave. So that would also mean continue. I think between now and seven, we can get everything that needs to be said. Um, I, I also did get a message that I, I believe it was within the last 15 years that the um, the zoning regulations were changed to remove that and um, if you are going to be looking for that, Carolyn. So I think you need to look only in the last 15 or so years. Um, are you talking about the State Zoning Act or Northampton? Because I believe it, it's three of us, have, including Carolyn, have been here for more than 15 years. Right, you that's know, true. And we've again, always I, interpreted it the same way. I, I have not seen this um, regulation. I just, somebody's telling me they think it was in the last 15 years. Okay. And, and Carolyn had well, said she was going to go look level. for it. Yeah. Um, Okay, so, I, I so, really... so why don't we, um, just for planning purposes, um, I, I do want people to have a chance to talk who want to address the, that, this appeal. Um, as we get closer to seven o'clock, we're gonna have to make a decision about either continuing again or having a vote, uh, but we need to, uh, it may depend on, um, yeah, I do. I do feel. I do think it's important to let people who want to speak have a chance to speak. So, um, I see one hand up. Um, I can't read the whole thing, but uh, Bucky Sparkle, um, Carolyn, do you want to call on that person? Um, sure. Go. Uh, go ahead, uh, Bucky. All right. Thank you very much, Miss Miss. Um, I'm glad to hear. Uh, first of all, my name is Bucky Sparkle. I live at 87 Grove Avenue, one of the two new homes that have been built at the end of Grove Avenue, uh, directly abutting the applicant in this case. Um, I did submit a letter uh, with a fair amount of detail, so I'm, I'm not going to go over that. That's, nobody wants to hear all of that again. Thank you for reading it. Um, I have heard things in this discussion this evening that I would like to comment on. Um, and um, so here we go. For, first, one question I have, and I'm sorry I was unable to attend the majority of the last meeting, 
Uh, I'm just curious if the city's attorney has been consulted in this matter because quite a bit of this seems to be hanging on legal arguments that from what I can tell are very much one-sided being purported by the applicant, of course, who has their perspective. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear uh, the perspective of uh, an advocate for the city and the public. Um, and, and maybe the attorney has been consulted. Um, uh, I do want to talk about a couple of things highlighting uh, regarding you know, frontage and public ways. We're talking about public ways quite a bit. Um, public way is one thing. The subdivision control law specifically talks about adequate public way being necessary. And while the educated, adjudicated, I think is the term, uh, court ordered end of the right of way of Grove Avenue, it does go all the way to the applicant's property. Adequate public way does not. And this is pretty, very specific. Uh, in the subdivision control law, because uh, we talk about safety, convenience, um, you know, fire, panic, flood, emergency vehicles, uh, where the pavement ends is really where the fire trucks end. Um, also, uh, coming talking about frontage and interpretations, and it sounds like maybe this city has changed its um, uh, zoning bylaws sometime, maybe 15 years ago, maybe not. Uh, we don't know the legislative history of this change as to why this change was made. So it's hard to point at something that used to be here and isn't and say, well, therefore something else must be true. Like you, we don't know anything about that uh, or even if it's real at this point. Um, the a &R handbook, which is put out by then um, Governor uh, Patrick Deval, Deval Patrick, <laughs> um, which was you know, updated as recently as 2010, um, did specifically reference, and it's been brought up, the Emory versus Crowley case, um, where it says, and, and in several places in the ANR handbook, it states that you know the the public frontage, the frontage is along the length, the longitudinal traveled way, and specifically does not cut across the dead end. So according to the ANR handbook, which is a guide to planning boards and ZBAs, says that dead ends do not count as frontage. Um, and I would, I would very significantly hope the board um, considers that. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the paper street. Uh, it's been brought up by the chair that, well, if, if we say the paper street is a reason to give frontage, well, then there's 700 feet of frontage available out here for the five lots. It's not just this property um, that might be impacted, let alone other properties uh, in, in the city. And it also has been brought up uh, a little bit that the uh, there there are mechanisms for creating new frontage and and determining you know wh which lots you know have have that adequate public way. The planning board does have those abilities, the expertise, uh, the experience in dealing with these manners. And uh, for as as venerable as this zoning board of appeals is, um, that that really isn't their job. So. It, I would highly recommend that the board, you know, uphold the building uh, inspector's decision, um, deny this appeal, and if the applicant wants to deal with frontage or create new frontage, that at the minimum that they go back to the planning board and go through that process there for review. Um, so, you know, I don't want to get into any more details of my letter, and I'm going to sort of rest my case at that point. Um, I'm very interested to see what the board comes up with in this case. Thank you. Thank you. And any, I see two more hands. Um, oh, the other one is Chris, maybe. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, hi, I live at 26 Grove Avenue. I'm uh, Chris Seacare. Um, I, I agreed with Bucky that it seems to me there are a lot of legal issues and having the uh, uh, city attorney uh, as part of what's going on seems to make sense to me. Uh, I also have a, a, a question uh, based on not certainly understanding the depth and details uh, uh, that Bucky just presented. But Grove Avenue comes to a dead end. Uh, and uh, my question is, if you're going to extend a road beyond a dead end and make it longer, uh, doesn't that have to go to the planning board? Um, OK. And there's Brad. OK, I see Brad. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Brad Carmody. I live um, at Two Beaverbrook Loop, which is in the <clears throat> um, in the previous uh, planned uh, Beaverbrook Estates. Um, I I would very much like the board to not um, overturn this and uphold the building inspector's decision for lots of the reasons that have been said here, but also I'd just like to talk about common sense for a second in terms of frontage. Um, maybe you could eke a driveway in there, maybe you could physically fit it, but it is very clearly, if you walk down there, there is no frontage for this property that they're talking about. <laughs> it's a, a dream. There, there's not any frontage there. They would have to improve the road and therefore it would go beyond 500 feet, which means that it, for a dead end in Northampton, you then have to put in a roundabout, I understand. <laughs> so um, there's absolutely no way that this can be done um in my opinion and 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 even if it goes to the, even if they take it to the planning board which is the proper place for it it seems to me from what i've heard tonight um i think they will reject it as well as they should thank you any other hands um trying to i think patrick uh, melnick I wants to speak Okay, but but why don't we just hear from? I see three there's more hands. Two, oh, okay. Two well, more. there's one person who already spoke, and then there's two other ones. Okay. Nelson uh, Sanger is one okay, of them. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we do Nelson Sanger next, please, and then Rose after that? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Karen Nelson. I live at 110 Florence Street in Leeds. Um, before I give my public comment, I need to disclose that I do work for Public Works and that my comments tonight are solely as a resident and a property owner in Northampton. I hope that the zoning board upholds the building commissioner's decision to deny this permit. Using the 50 feet at the end of the road as frontage is absurd. <laughs> um, this is not used anywhere else in the city. And when this has been tried, um it has become a private way and a cul-de-sac has been put at the end um also i'm confused about how um the city's easement um for the bike path would be impacted by this um in terms of using the argument that the argument that the applicant used about paper streets there are paper streets all over the city and if that is used as one of the arguments and that's approved that's going to open up a whole can of worm. There are paper streets all over the city that most people don't even know exist that go through the woods, go through their backyards. Um, this is just opens up a whole nother can of worms. So, and lastly, um, the parcel has been assessed for years as undevelopable. And a parcel, a developable parcel of that size in Northampton has an unbelievable amount of value. And if the owner and the previous owner have been paying, you know, pennies for it for the last couple of years, they've not been contributing to the tax base for the city. And now they want to use this argument that they have frontage on a street that they have not really been helping to pay to maintain the right of way. Um, I also want to echo Bucky's comment about whether or not the city's solicitor has been um, consulted about this decision. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, I think there might have been one more. Um, Rose. Rose. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you. Um, Rose, bookbinder of Goldstein. Um, I just heard some um, comments raised that I just wanted to answer just that um, the area uh, beyond the barrels, you know, as was stated, was made for the bike path and it is narrower. Um, and my guess is it was made so that, you know, improvements on the bike path could be made. And so there is a little wider area probably so that whatever, you know, kind of if they're, they might be plowing, having one of those little small plows go through to allow to turn around. Um, it's not, it wasn't made to gain access to, to that property. Um, and I just wanna point out a couple other things in terms of you know, speaking towards what everyone has said around gaining access on a 50 foot of a dead end. 
Um, you know, the police have ordered already no parking on that road because there's not a safe amount of space for people to turn around. Um, I don't really understand how people would access the bike path if there was a driveway put in there. Um, that seems dangerous to me for pedestrians and bikers. Um, and um, and also Beaver Brook development had to go through, you know, another access point because they denied access here previously already because of the same reason. So, you know, that's why there already isn't a road there is because it wasn't it was deemed not safe to do because of the, the shape and size of the road not being adequate to add additional houses. And I want to just second, you know, other people's um, comments, which is that if we we create an opening here for this, then there's possibility for many more openings, which then will just contribute to additional, you know, unsafe kinds of conditions for that road. Um, and um, I, I think that's it. So thank um, you. I, I have a question for Rose. Yes. May I, uh, David? Sure. Um, uh, Rose, what proof do you have that the um, widening piece was made for convenience of the bike path as opposed to um, access to the property. It wasn't there before. It was put there when the bike path was put in. Well, the, the previous it, it may, it, it, right. No, oh. but I, I'm asking if, if you have any specific proof because that may be coincidental. You know, we don't know. Um, and, and it's, I don't know if that was speculation or assumption on your part, or if you actually know that for a fact. And if it's a fact, what proof you might have of that? Um, well, my, my only proof is that that addition was put in when the right of way was granted to make the bike path. So okay. they put that, you know, additional, um, they paved there when they made the bike path and that, and it starts right there, the bike path. So. Okay. That is the bike path. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thank yeah. Um, is there anyone else? Um, I see two names. Did we hear from Chris? I know I see Alyssa as well, but have we heard from. We heard from Chris. We need to hear okay, so from. So just Alyssa then. And then. Alyssa? Or her husband, uh, Nelson Geis. I live at 72 Chestnut Avenue Extension in the Beaverbrook development. Um, I just like to comment on all the appeals to common sense and can of worms and you know on my drawing here that's probably not submitted you know i've highlighted the uh the lot outline and it is may actually be shaped like a can of worms uh you know there's clear intent with the shape of this lot to grant access to other uh lots and i would just like that to be considered uh that you know okay. this is uh, the, the opening salvo. And Pat, I love it here. It's a great development. So thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm still seeing one hand for Chris, but did we already hear from Chris? Yes. And uh, now I see Carolyn Lorenzo. Could, could we hear from Carolyn? Hi, sorry. Yeah, um, I'm Carolyn. I live at 83 Grove Ave. And um, I think I just, you know, I'm learning a lot. This is my first, uh, the last one in this one is my first experience of the ZBA hearings. And um, so I don't, you know, I don't feel that I have the old, I think other of, others have said this, like Chris, I don't have all the knowledge to be able to say what you should do, but I feel concerned as an observer, just feeling like, and I do think that Bucky spoke to this is, some of what we're hearing from the attorney when we live here isn't some of the facts. Like for example, the assertion that 83 where I live, we didn't build this. I don't know, again, the zoning um, process to get the approval to build this. We bought it and moved in a couple of years ago, but we're not the last house on the street. We're on, and we are a part of the street up until the dead end. And so it just, and I know you're all incredibly intelligent and also lawyers, but it just, it made sense to me to think, is this are facts being presented the only facts that count? Do you know what I mean? Like, anyway, so I just, I just am sort of, <laughs> I guess, 
it just seems there's a lot we don't know some of us. Okay. Thank you. I see another face here. Uh, oh, it's Mr. Melnick. Yeah, I'm trying to. Yes. <laughs> uh, did, did, did Carolyn finish her comments? I couldn't quite tell. Yeah, it looks like. Yes, yeah, sorry, I lowered my hand now. Sorry. Okay, sure. Thank you. Uh, and I know, Mr. Melnick, you were waiting to speak. So uh, you, you, to clarify, I believe you are the appellant, correct? Yeah, I'll, I am with uh, Raul, who is going to build a house here. I'm not interested in building a house here. But just a, a couple points of clarification. Number one, this part of the bike path was just volunteered by me to the, to the city. The part of the bike path that I did in connection with my development is farther down the way. It's at the end of the Beaverbrook Loop and goes down, you know, to the uh, uh, the main bike path in a, uh, on a dirt trail. So that's the one I built, and that's the one that I was required to do. This had nothing to do with any conditions of Beaverbrook. This is just a donation I, I gave to the city because I thought it was a good idea. The second thing I want to say is the purpose of this for me. I'm really retired. I'm out of everything. I just want to. Uh, 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 have Mr. Rule build a house here. And frankly, I don't have any interest in expanding this road to develop any of the other lots. This would actually prohibit, probably, stop any further development because this part of the land, including the fee of the, of the street, is owned by me. If you let Rule build, build this lot, he's going to own the entire thing. I'm going to give him the fee and he, he's going to, that's going to dead end every development. If you make, if you deny it and you make me go to the planning board, the only alternative to developing this lot would be to improve the whole street, get the other lots in line or, you know, available for development, which is not my intent. I don't think it's a good idea. I think this lot is suitable for development. It's something that is, uh, uh, Raul wants to build a house here. And uh, I, I, I know for a fact, the old zoning specifically said you can't use the end of a street. When they codified zoning and they changed it, then they did not put that provision in but the old zoning specifically said you can't. This one does not say that. So if we use that 50 feet, that's the end of the street. I understand that it's not usual to use that, but the ordinance says you can use 50 feet of frontage in a public way. The judge ruled our public way goes to my lot. And uh, if you look at the bigger picture, just letting this house be built is gonna prevent further development from down the way, which is part of behind the scenes by my hope. That's, that's the end of it. Thank you. Okay, any, I don't think there's anyone else waiting. Now, Carolyn is gonna have to go in a few minutes. Um, um, she, she actually is, is she back? Carolyn, are you back? No. Yeah, I'm oh. back. I'm oh, just okay. going okay. on two different devices. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so board members, um, a motion I think to we've, close the public hearing. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we've heard uh, everything that we can hear. Um, and so uh, th there's a motion. I think that was a motion, Elizabeth, to close the public hearing. And just for everybody's edification, once we vote and pass that motion, we're not able to have any more input from either the public or uh, the, the appellant or his uh, representative. So we have a motion, Sarah, to close the public hearing. Sarah, um, do we have a second? Seconding Elizabeth's motion. Okay, and then we need a roll call for the for the virtual meeting, Carolyn. Um, Elizabeth? Yes. Uh, Sarah? Yes. And David? Yes. So that passes, that's unanimous. Um, and, um, I guess we could, uh, it might be appropriate to have a motion one way or the other on the appellant's request to overturn the building inspector's decision and then can, discussion can continue after, after the motion uh, as we feel it's needed. Um, Rather than- But I think a lot, of, a lot of opinions have been, a lot of viewpoints have been voiced, but go ahead, Sarah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we need a motion before continuing amongst ourselves, our public meeting? Uh, we could do it either way, but I'm thinking just to bring it to closure, should we have a motion on the appeal? Or, uh, you know, to, Carolyn, is that appropriate? Or like any other 
decision we make? Yeah, make a motion on the um, uh, appeal, we, then have, yeah. then have, um, yeah, discussion. discussion. We have a motion and a second, but it would be, for example, a motion to uh, uphold the decision of the building inspector, for example. So, but so Elizabeth or Sarah, did you want to do that? I'll defer to Sarah. Um, I, I, I guess I wanted to do, to do some discussion first. I don't, we don't often have the uh, motion immediately at the beginning of discussion. Okay, I just felt like there's been a lot of discussion, but 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 uh, by all means, just our zoning board public meeting discussion. Got it. Um, That's fine. Okay, so keeping it brief, I can say that this is uh, this has been thorny. There have been good arguments on both sides, and um, and I understand the building inspectors. Uh, position of having to uh, uh, essentially make someone else make the decision. And so I'm just, uh, I, I wanted to talk about it with uh, Elizabeth and David about our jurisdiction and exactly um, as, as Elizabeth pointed out, it would be good to clean up some of these things and I'm not sure we can. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's okay. Is that, I don't, is that, I don't have a clear that, uh, path. Right. At the moment. Elizabeth, do you feel like you have a clear path? I appreciate the muddiness that you're feeling um, about this. Um, I, I also feel like we've gone down lots of different branches and limbs um, within those branches. But I, I, I think um, What I've heard leads me to think that there is probably not sufficient frontage, although I think that the city could probably clarify this. Um, um, better, you know, in the future, but I do think we run the risk if we overturn the building commissioners decision of running afoul of what the subdivision process is meant to do and meant to be, which is ensure that the property is got safe access, um, safe for a whole variety of reasons, um, and that we know exactly how we're measuring frontage, um, that we're I, I'm not prepared to say that a paper street, um, which was done so many years ago and not recognized by the city is sufficient to establish frontage. Um, I have to say parenthetically, just unrelated to this, and I know that access is, um, you know, safety access is on from the street, but Today I was riding my bike up Chesterfield Road. And for those of you who know Chesterfield Road, it's a very, very steep street. And near the crest of the hill, they were trying to bring in part of a house, part of a prefab house. Um, so it was coming down the hill, right from the crest, just down a little bit, and then up a little driveway. And it was stuck across the entire width of the street. Um, even though it was as narrow as a fire truck, um, it was probably even a little bit higher suspension than a fire truck. There was no getting that up there. Um, and it was a long driveway. So, I mean, I, I don't know the outcome. I assume it's not still, still there all these hours later, but it did make me cognizant of how 
um, sensitive to the vagaries of access these issues are. So um, I don't, pret pret I mean, I, I do believe the city solicitor has looked at this. Um, I'm a lawyer, David's a lawyer, we've looked at the law um, and Sarah's an engineer. So I, I think in answer to some of the questions out there, um, I, I think we've looked at this. I don't, I don't feel capable of saying the building commissioner was wrong in the decision. Um, I, I think that if there were no other avenue for the appellant to pursue that this would, this would be harder on a gut level for me, but there is a good avenue and it's one that for me wouldn't ensure that the process is done in a way to um, accommodate the needs of the balance needs, both of the building, you know, of the appellant in the building and of the community in terms of the access um, to the property and the safety um, of the access. So that, that's kind of where I'm landing. Um, I feel for the appellant. I, you know, I, 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 I'm not as sensitive to the arguments of not wanting the property developed. Um, you know, you hear that a lot, but in, 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 a, in I, I would like to see the appellant revert to the process that's available to them to, to go ahead with this. And in, in the process of doing that, and, and who knows, I mean, this may get appealed to court, which is fine too. Um, we may get some clarifications on some of the thornier issues, but I, I, have, I have confidence in our building commissioner's decision. We've seen it before. Um, and I think for the sake of consistency, we need to uphold this decision. Okay. Thank you. Um, and of course, it would take a unanimous vote to overturn it of the three of us. Um, yeah, I, I'm cognizant. I, I, I think you sort of said everything that I was thinking, Elizabeth. Um, <clears throat> there's, uh, on the one hand, you know, as volunteer members of a municipal board, we um, we do our best to interpret and apply the ordinance as well as we possibly can given the facts and arguments that are presented to us. It is true we did not have the benefit to my knowledge, at least no, none of the board members had any contact with the city solicitor. And it's not our role to advocate against uh, a party appearing in front of us. Um, I would point out that I think uh, the letter dated June 8th from Bucky and Emily Sparkle was it's a pretty good brief on, yeah, uh, from, for, for, for the other side, so to speak, or in this case, the side of the city, absent the, and I would refer people to that if, if they have questions about some of the basis for the decision that we're making. Um, but, um, but we are also supposed to apply common sense. And in this case, the common sense gut reaction, I think, as Elizabeth has already said for me as well, is there's a right way to do this. We have an extremely capable board already sitting, namely the planning board, and this is what they do, and this is what they're there for. And ultimately, this is about balancing the interests, but also protecting public safety and the needs of the community as a whole, and balancing those interests against a private property owner. And I am also, Elizabeth, very sensitive to the predicament that this creates not only for the owner, but for the people who were hoping to build a house there. And, and I'm hopeful they still will be able to build a house there. But, but these, all of these issues that have been raised and were certainly required to take into account the concerns of the neighbors, uh, which we've heard, uh, um, those aren't dispositive, but, but they are always very much a part of our analysis. Um, but ultimately, um, my understanding is we have always interpreted the ordinance to mean that the dead end of a, of a public way does not satisfy a frontage requirement. And, um, and a reference to a change in the ordinance uh, maybe 15 years ago that took that out. Um, um, as I think 
Mr. Sparkle mentioned is, is, is not really dispositive of anything either. Um, I'm not doubting the memory of the person who spoke about that, but, but, um, but that's not something we can hang a hat on. Um, so, you know, for the reasons in Bucky and Emily Sparko's letter, and for the reasons I think that have already been said um, during the course of these two hearings, um, uh, including Elizabeth's point about the faith and confidence in, in our building commissioner, um, overturning any decision of our building commissioner is, is never anything we do lightly. Um, I, I think I would also have to uh, to uh, vote to, to support the decision of the building commission. I'd like to make a motion. Okay. I move that we deny the appeal of the building commissioner's decision um, regarding a, a lot is a, not a buildable lot, end of Grove Ave, leads map ID 5 12. Okay. And a second, please. A second. Okay, and I guess we need a roll call, Carolyn. Uh, Elizabeth Silver. I think that's a yes. There were a few negatives. Yeah, we're, we're voting to uphold the decision, correct, of the yeah. building inspector yes. as the that's motion a, was a presented. Yes. Yes. We deny the appeal. We uphold the decision. Yes. Yes. Sarah, yes uh, so down. Elizabeth Silver, yes. Sarah Northrup, yes. David Bloomberg, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think we have minutes, maybe. Yes, uh, of May twenty seventh. At least for two weeks ago. Yep. I did see one one thing in there, Carolyn, that uh, caught my eye. Let me see if I can find it. I'm going to head out, but I would want to just thank everybody for their time. And thank okay. you. Um, you've done an amazing job with this presentation, and um, I wish you and the appellant the best. And All right. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Um, let's see. I'm sorry. I'm looking for the minutes. Yeah. Which email was that attached to Carolyn? Uh, a bunch. Oh. All right. From uh, Monday, I think. That was June 6th, 7th. Yeah. Uh, it was the third actually minutes of May 27th. The word document attached to the June 3rd email from Carolyn. Sorry. June 30th, uh, June 3rd. I'm sorry. June three, yeah. Mm -hmm. God, I'm open up, open up. There it is. Uh, I have to get there. Is there a typo? Is that what you're? Uh, you know, yeah, right? yeah. Uh, or just a turn of phrase. I should have marked it. Um, oh, there it is. Sorry. I don't know why I didn't mark it. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I lost this. Um, Do you want me to resend it to you right no, now? No, no, no. I mean, I have it now. I oh. just, I mean, I lost it when you sent it and I didn't have a chance to read it. I'm sorry. So I'm just running through it now. Well, I suppose, I mean, we could, I suppose we could vote on the minutes at the next meeting. Well, yeah, they're, they're not absolutely. that long. Yeah, yeah, but that might be a good, that might actually be a good idea. Um, All right, and we can put it I'm together thinking, with the yeah. minutes from tonight. And, and okay. be able to digest them, yeah. Okay, all right, sorry um, about that. And, and that's okay, speaking of next meetings, um, I know yeah. there are emails, uh, what-, what uh, was the, Not was, till at least July 8th, but I don't think we're gonna have anything. I need to double check, but I'll let you know tomorrow. Oh, that'd be great so if we knew that far in advance. And then the other one is okay. in August 12th, I think. August it was. 12th. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wait, hold hold on, please. I'm just, I just want to get these in here. Let's see the question. Come on, dude. Question mark. Um, and I'm sorry, the, the next one was August 12th. Right. After the July. And, yeah. And we may not have, I realize we may not have one in July. Right. August 12th, 530. Okay. Um, if there is there any other business, Carolyn, was there something about renewing terms and things? I saw in an email somewhere. Uh, my, I can check that. That would have been individually, not as a board. Oh, I see. Okay. So I'll double um, check. We should revisit that. And make sure our that housekeeping is in order. Yep. I usually get an email from the mayor's office. 
Okay. Yeah. Now, are we able to, right. I, I realize we're still in a public hearing, but out of curiosity, are we able to tell if anyone else is still in the room? So yes, to speak? we can tell and there's nobody else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah, I just wanted to say, I didn't mean to cut off discussion when I was calling for a motion and I'm sorry if that came across that no, way. I just, no, not at all. Just, not all was fine. I just, I just, uh, okay. I just wasn't prepared to make a motion. Okay. Yet. No, that's fair enough. Fair enough. And, and okay, good. I didn't mean that in any way. No. Um, anything else? Uh, I guess no. other than a motion. Thank to you, adjourn, David. So. I thought you were brilliant. Good uh, job. How you handled it, really. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you. And Carolyn. This is a tough one. Yes. Well, yes. One yes. Yes. Thank well, you, Carolyn. Always this Carolyn. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This was a challenge, but uh, it was. It was. But yeah. So, really um, well. and I guess you'll be draft. Obviously, Carolyn, you'll draft the decision. But I think we should take a good look at the decision. Sure. Um, um, yep. And then, and also the minutes. Um, yeah. And the appeal period is 20 days from the decision, right? Right. Uh, is that true for appeals like this? Okay, good. From so I guess we just have a decision a, from receipt. Uh, when it goes 20 to the town, days city from clerk. it goes to clerk. Yeah. Yeah, city clerk delivered to the clerk. You'll let us know because it'd be interesting yeah. to watch those 20 days. So um, I guess I guess if that's an emo just a motion to adjourn, please. So moved. Yep. Okay. Second. Second. Then roll and call, please. Elizabeth Silver. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Sarah Northrup. Aye. David Boomer. Yes. All right. Thank thanks, you, everybody. Everyone. See you guys. Thanks for all your help.